I'm Lindy Johnson, Policy Director at the East Bay Leadership Council, and I'm joined today by our fellow sponsor organizations, East Bay EDA, the Bay Area Council, and Innovation Tri-Valley Leadership Group. Thank you all for being part of this. Uh, the person elected to the Assembly District 20 will represent more than 500,000 East Bay residents in cities such as San Leandro, Hayward, and Dublin. The diverse community is highly educated with a high college graduation rate and a very low housing vacancy rate. Understandably, many of the issues that have been brought up in this race have revolved around housing, affordability and access, and jobs and economic development. We're going to begin our forum with introductions from both candidates, Sean Kumagai and Liz Ortega, and then we're gonna jump into questions. If you have a question for the candidate, please use the question and answer function on Zoom. It's a little uh, icon at the bottom of the gray box in the bottom of your screen. Uh, please use the Q&A function on Zoom and we'll do our best to get to as many of the questions you submit as we can. We're gonna end the question portion of this forum at about 10.50 so that each candidate has an opportunity to provide some final thoughts. Thank you for joining us and we're excited to dive in. Sean, would you be willing to start us off with an introduction? I'd be happy to. Uh, thank you very much, Lindy, uh, and the entire East Bay Leadership Council team and all of the partners here today for putting on this important discussion. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sean Kumagai. I'm a 21-year veteran of the United States Navy, current council member in the city of Dublin, and I'm district director to Assembly Member Rebecca bauer Cahan, one of our East Bay uh, delegates to Sacramento. And uh, I'm very proud to be running for this seat to represent the people of the 20th Assembly District. You know, um, I got started in um, politics really when I ran for city council because I wanted to take on um, housing affordability. As a veteran returning to the Bay Area in 2015 after a deployment, my mother had recently passed away and I was taking custody of my younger brother who was in middle school at the time. And I had an opportunity to come on assignment here in Dublin where I had been uh, drilling for years at the Camp Parks Reserve Forces training area. As a veteran, as someone with a master's degree, uh, a career under my belt, working for the government, I could barely find a place to live. And I knew that that was a problem because if I was struggling, there were so many others who were in a tough spot. So I ran for city council uh, to do something about it. And while on city council, I've made it my mission to create more housing across the affordability spectrum to create more affordable housing. And that's what we've done. We've created over a thousand units of middle income housing. We've approved and titled uh, three affordable housing projects for our teachers, firefighters, and seniors. We've done uh, so much work in this area and there's so much more work to do. Uh, I also made sure that um, we are one of the safest communities in the, the East Bay. And you know, as a, as a veteran, um, I know how important it is, how sacred it is, our charge to keep our community safe. And that's, uh, I take that responsibility very seriously. And uh, that's why we uh, made sure that our uh, law enforcement and our firefighters were well-resourced. We continue to uh, provide the funds um, to make sure that they could keep our community safe. And we worked hand in hand with them to do that. And then finally, you know, we're, we're really, um, seeing uh, this plague of homelessness throughout our communities. And it's time for us to step up and, and take some se uh, serious action. So I'm running for assembly because we need a common sense leader, someone you can trust who's got years of experience getting results for Alameda County families. And as the only LGBTQ and AAPI elected official in this race, I believe diversity and experience matters. I've been trusted by Alameda Cam County families as a elected council member, and I've delivered on my promises when it comes to affordable housing, balancing our city's budget four years running, expanding good paying green jobs and strengthening our economy and making sure our cities are safer. Those are common sense results you can expect from me in Sacramento. And that means I'm gonna practice fiscal responsibility with your taxpayer money and, your, and our state budget. I'm gonna take on the affordability crisis, clean up our public spaces for our seniors, families and children by moving people out of tent encampments and into housing and keeping our neighborhoods safe. That's why I'm endorsed by over 100 state and local elected officials and community leaders, democratic hubs, labor unions, business and trade organizations, 
across Alameda County and across the state. And I'm very much looking forward to having this conversation with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Liz, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to be here today. Uh, I'm a little tired of the Zooms, but um, ready to get this conversation going. My name is Liz Ortega, and I am currently the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Alameda Labor Council. Uh, it's an elected position in which I was privileged to be uh, as elected for uh, almost five years ago. And I'm running to represent you as your next assembly member. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the race before I get to more about who I am. Uh, this race is really about who you will choose to take the fight to Sacramento. Your choice is gonna come down to two people, someone who is backed by outside corporate interests or someone who has the people of this community behind them. Um, you know, over my 20 year track record and career in living in the East Bay, I fought and won to make sure that our reproductive rights are always protected, especially right now when my daughter has less rights than I do. I fought to ensure that every woman and senior receives the healthcare screenings, contraception, and mental health services they need. I stood up and fought back and won against polluters who want to affect our air quality and health. I also fought and know the many working moms who can barely make ends meet with the banks knocking on their doors, demanding payments that they could barely make, including myself. So while I've lived those experiences, I've also stood up and fought against them because it's not okay for us to be the largest uh, state in the country, the third largest budget in the world, uh, to have to have this kind of suffering at a time when there's so much need. This is why I've dedicated over 20 years towards passing legislation in Sacramento, towards passing budgets that are real reflection of our community and stand up against the status quo every single day. So this is about bringing people together, tackling tough issues and getting things done that will deliver real results. I have the experience representing 135 different unions, the experience of working with every single local elected official, state official, and national official. I am the first Latina in history to ever be elected to this position. And I have a track record of fighting for working families and expanding opportunities for every resident here and in Sacramento. And that is why you have two Democrats here, but only one of us has the Democratic Party endorsement, the Planned Parenthood endorsement, California Nurses Association, and hundreds of others who have seen me secure paid sick leave for working families, work on housing issues, and ended instances of environmental racism. So again, you all gonna have a choice come November. You either get behind Liz Ortega, who is supported by some of the the most impacted communities in this community and this district, or someone who is supported by the largest corporations in the world, whose guiding star is greed. Thank you. Thank you, Sean and Liz for providing some introductions. We have a set list of questions that we're excited to dive into, but I did just wanna mention again to our attendees that if you have a question, we do have a Q&A function here on the Zoom. We've already got a few questions submitted, which is great. So if you have something you'd like to add, please feel free to use the Q&A function here on the Zoom. All of the sponsor organizations for this event are really invested in economic development. So I'd like to start there. Um, and I will kind of put forward a question and then call on one of you to get us started. Uh, but our first question really does relate to how to support economic development in AD20. If you are elected, what kind of activities do you think you would implement or how would you support economic development within that district? And Liz, we'll start with you. I mean, I do it as part of my daily job. I work with employers every day. I work with our workforce investment boards, with our community colleges to make sure that we have good um, trained workforce ready for the jobs of the future, whether it's in construction, whether it's healthcare, whether it's technology, 
Um, in fact, as a leader of the Labor Council, I get to appoint several of my own leaders to sit on several boards um, to ensure that we're having those conversations. Um, you know, and one of the, the biggest projects or economic development projects that I'm working on now, and it's not directly, you know, in my assembly district, however, it could impact the entire area, which is making sure that the A's stay in Oakland. This is a billion dollar project that's gonna have economic impact all over this county. And that includes Assembly District 20. So I've been working with multiple stakeholders, unions, communities, port representatives, states, and various other agencies to get closer um, to a deal. Uh, you know, recently and we're closer than we've ever been before. And so being able to take that experience and bring it to my district is a priority to make sure that we particularly grow, grow our small businesses, many who are um, were devastated by COVID and who are people of color, who have had to go through lots of red tape, who weren't able to access loans, and who up until recently have never talked to an elected official. Um, and so that's the kind of structure that I wanna work on when it comes to economic development, making sure that we have you know, uh, the workforce ready um, through various sectors and making sure that we have the jobs that are available and the employers that are ready to take on those workers and put them in, in a, you know, good jobs where they don't have to work two or three just to pay their rent. Thank you. Thank you. Sean, would you like to talk to your thoughts about economic development in 8020? Absolutely. Uh, you know, as a as a council member, as a district director for Assembly Member Bauer Cahan, I have enjoyed working hand in hand with East Bay Leadership Council, uh, with Innovation Tri Valley, and our uh, business and industry groups across the Bay Area. You know, and it's uh, to me, uh, it's really about collaboration. You know, and as a, a city council member, I sit on our Economic Development Committee, and you know, in, in at the city level, we're mostly focused on our on our local economy, our microeconomy, and our small businesses. Um, but we also work hand in hand with our economic de uh, development director to make sure that we are thinking regionally. We're thinking about not only what are the problems in front of us right now, but how do we plan for the jobs of the future? And the innovation economy is a big part of that. I think at the state level, we have a serious responsibility to make sure that we maintain a climate where we can innovate. And it's not just about businesses. It's about the nexus of industry, government, and education. And that's what we've done, for example, with Innovation Tri-Valley. You know, we supported the uh, Vision uh, 2040 plan for the Tri-Valley to bring all of our ed uh, agencies, our education system together, along with businesses hand in hand to make sure that we are planning for the future. And it doesn't, it doesn't just encompass workers. Absolutely, workers are a big part of that. It also encompasses uh, the education system. It encompasses how do we um, create the right climate so that innovators can thrive. And that's how we're gonna solve our most complex problems. It's not gonna be by being in an adversarial relationship between government and industry or government and workers, we all need to lock arms if we're gonna solve these issues. You know, and uh, I think the uh, contrast is quite stark when my opponent thinks that the guiding principle for industry and businesses is greed. I would just really encourage her to, to meet with some of them because that's not what I hear. And when they, um, you know, when, when they meet with me, they have concerns about workers. They have concerns about housing. They want to do a good job and they want to provide a good product and service. And they want to, yes, make a little bit of money in the process. But, you know, that is really the difference between me and my opponent. I am willing to sit down and meet with all stakeholders on a given policy issue, whether or not I agree with them. Take all of that feedback into consideration and make sure that uh, that is informing those policy decisions. My opponent, on the other hand, has a disturbing uh, history of refusing to meet with business and industry um, uh, associations. And I just don't think that's good governance. And I don't think that's uh, honoring our responsibility as elected officials. 
Well, you both bring up small business, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts on the kind of policies you'd want to implement to help small businesses. I mean, I think it's clear you both recognize the importance that they bring to our community, but I'm curious if there's any concrete policy examples you might be able to give about how you think we can help our small businesses, especially as we are continuing to move through kind of a recovery period following COVID-19. And Sean, I'll let you start us with that one. Absolutely. I mean, I uh, out talking to small businesses all the time um, in both my official capacity and as a candidate. That's why I'm proud to have the endorsement of the Hayward Chamber of Commerce, the Pleasanton Chamber of Commerce, and over a dozen business and industry associations. You know, it's really uh, at the small business level, they want to make sure that they have a seat at the table and that they can express to their elected officials how policy is affecting them. During the pandemic, uh, we took bold action in Dublin. We took a million dollars from our uh, ARPA funds and we put that towards commercial rent relief for uh, business, small businesses such as restaurants and retail, brick and mortar in Dublin. And you know the issue was that the federal, state, and county aid was not touching com small commercial tenants, right? They didn't have any support there. And our program has been hugely successful in making sure that businesses weren't shuttered. We also adjusted our uh, zoning and permitting. We allowed businesses to open up out into uh, parking lots. We lowered parking minimums. We created temporary uses uh, for tents and other um, ways for them to operate outside. We helped them navigate regulations. And overall, that's what I hear most from small businesses, that they want to, uh, they want someone who can help them to navigate this very complex business environment is willing to listen to them and then give them, you know, a chance to, to survive. But I think what we have to be really mindful of is that small businesses are disproportionately impacted and they're a huge part of our economy. We have, we see that women, people of color, Asian Americans, so many people who are otherwise don't have access to opportunity are using entrepreneurship and small businesses to, to get started and, and to, to make a, a good living for them and their families. So I think it's really important that we protect, protect our small business uh, communities. And we really think about when we're doing these very large statewide policy changes, how that's impacting them. And that's always been my promise uh, to, to small businesses, that I'll have an open door, an open ear, and that I will try to my best to make sure that they're not uh, disproportionately impacted by these policies. Thank you, Sean. Liz, would you like to speak to some of your thoughts on how we would support small businesses? Yeah, um, first I would like to respond uh, to my opponent. I mean, I honestly don't know what record he's talking about. It is my role and my responsibility to meet with everyone in the community and particularly employers. As I mentioned, I'm working with the A's, I'm working with small businesses. I work with employers all the time, connecting workers. You can't have an employer without workers. Um, you know, and I will continue to meet with those businesses. Uh, my role is to have that dialogue, but here's the distinction. My opponent has not met with janitors, nurses, housekeepers, et cetera. I mean, he's easily meeting with businesses, but not willing to talk to those that were most impacted by this community. I have a large group of residents in Assembly District 20 who are living below the minimum wage, who are barely making it. And those are the people that I have not had the opportunity to meet with my opponent. In fact, he's neglected to meet with them when my nurses tried to reach out. Um, so in terms of the small and minority owned businesses to receive, um, you know, the help that we can do is to make sure that they, um, I want to make sure that they receive their certification to open their small businesses faster. I want to be able to work with our banks to make sure that there is no longer some discrimination when it comes to loaning. We've seen data that's come out time and time again that reflects that minority owned businesses do not have the same access to loans as their white counterparts. And one thing that hasn't been mentioned is equity. I get up and fight for equity every single day. And that's what I'm gonna do when I get to Sacramento. I wanna make sure that our small businesses um, don't have to go through all the hurdles that they've already gone through coming out of this pandemic and make it easier for them to have those kinds of access to be able to thrive in Assembly District 20. Thank you. I think that this has been a great start. 
Um, I also do just want to acknowledge, I think our attendees are really excited to hear about your policy ideas and grateful to have you both here. I hope that we can try to keep this as positive as we can as we continue through the questions. Um, I'd like to jump to transportation because we live in an area where there is a lot of traffic and mobility related issues. And so I'm curious what you see the state's role being in supporting the local transportation system um, and how you might support that local transportation system as an elected official in Sacramento. Liz, would you like to start us with that? Sure. I mean, the transportation system has really taken a hit um, in terms of resources. I think one of the biggest things we get to um, advocate for in Sacramento is our budget. I think wanting to make sure that we, you know, look at the budget, the state's budget, and make sure that we're working as a regional, you know, transportation is a regional issue. It's not a district by district. And so making sure that there's resources available to enhance our infrastructure, um, to make sure that, you know, our agent transportation system is up to date, uh, to make sure that the that it's in line with our climate goals. And then most importantly, that it's reliable and accessible, uh, especially to those communities who have been disadvantaged and don't have access to you know, electric vehicles per se, and uh, rely on our transportation system. So making sure that we figure out a way to work with them to make sure that they have access to them. Um, and so resources and policies to ensure that our most vulnerable communities have access to transportation that will get them to work, get them to home, but also protect our climate. Thank you. Sean? Uh, predominantly, I see the state role uh, two things, twofold. Uh, one is to shepherd as much funding as possible into public transportation system of, in the, of the 21st century. And uh, two, uh, I really think that it's about coordination. I mean, here in the Bay Area, we have so many local transit agencies. We have this hodgepodge. And that's why I was a big supporter of Seamless Bay Area, so that we can figure out a way to start bringing these systems together so that people can utilize them in a, uh, in a better, seamless way. You know, and I think part of the problem is, of course, is that uh, through the pandemic, we've seen, you know, these transit systems are very dependent on ridership. And they get designed based off of that, uh, you know, fare box return. And, you know, we're really going to have to start thinking as a state about how we invest all of this infrastructure money that's coming down, how we invest our ongoing funds. And yes, perhaps how we look at um, some kind of revenue measure so that we can add more money to the system so that it's not so susceptible to these ebbs and flows in ridership. Um, I'm a big supporter of, of Valley Link. You know, as a council member, we've um, advocated for this commuter rail project to connect the uh, 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 San Joaquin Valley into um, the Tri-Valley. And it's part of a larger statewide rail system, you know, that includes things like high-speed rail and commuter rail. We need to create a connected system of rail if we're gonna really make this effective. But as a uh, council member who has a, it represents a city that sits on the 580, um, as someone who's running for a district that is cut up by, by interstates, we see the impacts of this traffic on a daily basis. We need to get more people out of their cars and into, uh, into public transit. And that means big, bold projects like commuter rail projects. It also means that we need to solve the issue of imbalance between housing and transit, develop more in, in transit oriented districts, but also create economic opportunities locally for these various communities so that people don't have to travel two hours one way to get to a job. You know, those opportunities should be there. And uh, frankly, the housing should be there for when they're taking those jobs in the areas that they're working at. You know, I have this crazy notion that you should be able to live in the community that you work in if you choose to. And in this housing market, unfortunately, it's so dysfunctional, uh, we can't do that. And when I talk to employers, when I talk to members of these organizations, um, they are stomping their foot and saying, we need more housing across the affordability spectrum in order to attract good talent into our industries. And that's, that's gonna be part of my overall solution as well for um, our, our transit issues. 
Great. I appreciate you bringing us into housing because that is the topic I'd like us to move towards next. Both of you have identified affordable housing as a top priority. Uh, and the organizations that are hosting and sponsoring this really share that priority and are especially concentrated on increasing production. So I'm curious if you can speak to how you think the legislature can support increased production in California and what you see your role being uh, if you become the elected official in AB20. Um, go ahead and why don't you start us off with that, John? Uh, it's my favorite topic. If we can talk for the next 30 minutes, I would talk about this topic. You know, housing is uh, it's a passion of mine, as I mentioned at the head of this, um, you know, and, and yes, me and my opponent both recognize that housing is a big issue. And I'm glad that East Bay Leadership Council um, and, and the other groups here recognize that it's not only about affordability, but also about production in general. The fact of the matter is, is that we have underdeveloped for decades, you know, by any estimate, we're between a million to three million housing units under production. Uh, from where we should be. And if we do not fix our systems, it's going to continue to be a problem. And we need to put everything on the table. You know, I think we really, there's there's finally, I think, appetite in Sacramento to talk about CEQA reform. We can and must protect our environment and build more housing. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. When we build smart, when we plan good communities, we're, we're gonna reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We're gonna reduce our vehicle miles traveled, right? And when we build in our existing communities, it means less demand on infrastructure, not more, right? It's the problem is, is that the system as it's been set up has uh, been to uh, restrict housing in existing communities, encourage additional sprawl. And that's how we're, we're kind of getting into the issue that we're here now. So that's kind of what I, I see as my main charge going to Sacramento is how do we streamline things in a meaningful way so that we can produce more housing? And that means also more resources. Absolutely, we need affordable housing um, in every community and that's gonna take uh, money. That's why I, I'm a big supporter of AB 2011 that uh, Assembly Member Buffy Wicks just shepherded through along with my, my endorsers, the NorCal Carpenters. You know, this is going to create an opportunity to open up underutilized commercially zoned um, areas for additional housing while paying a living wage with medical benefits. I mean, this is a game changer. There's so much under underutilized uh, commercial in our communities, and uh, the developers simply don't want to go through the laborious and expensive process of rezoning that. So this opens that up for them to for them to utilize, and honestly, it's great for the community to have mixed use development on some of these strip malls or even malls. This district has uh, three malls in it, three old shopping malls in it. Those are ripe for redevelopment. And finally, real quick, it, you know, I'm I'm a big proponent of bringing back some form of redevelopment agency. Now, you know, the old system wasn't working, so it's it's got to look like something different. I'm exploring things like tax increment financing that we're seeing in, in other uh, jurisdictions and maybe bringing some of that statewide. But we've got to bring more resources to bear so that we can do these, these big, bold projects in our communities. Thank you, Sean. Liz, would you like to talk to us about housing production? Yes, um, I won't talk for 30 minutes about it, but I do have a large portion of my uh, district that prioritizes housing and sees homelessness as a, a huge issue. And many who are working two or three jobs and can't afford to pay the rent. And so my platform is about making sure that housing is a human right. And it's not just a slogan, but an actual deliverable. You know, as an elected leader and, you know, as the leader of the Labor Council, I've worked hard with local elected officials to try to address the housing crisis by, you know, partnering, making sure that we have, that our teachers have access to apartments where they're not having to spend 50 or 30% of their wages on them, but actually be able to get into an apartment. And that's something that we've been able to partner on with uh, the city of Oakland. Um, you know, I want to make sure that we, you know, we can build and build and build and streamline, but if we just focus on market rate and not really focus on affordability and the renters, 
um, then we're going to end up with what we're seeing now. It's like we're going to go in circles. Uh, recently, I was talking to some um, at a community. I've been doing lawn parties, talking to our, our voters in the district. And I actually had an elected official who was very proud of the fact that they opened up a parking lot for folks to be able to sleep in their cars that night and not worry about being harassed or their cars being towed. If that's the bar that we're looking at, then that's just not acceptable. Um, one of the things that I've been looking at and want to work with Assembly Member uh, Wicks, who's endorsed me, by the way, and Attorney General Rob Bonta, who's also endorsed me, is twofold. Making sure, yes, we have housing um, that's built, that's, a, that's market rate and affordable, although I want to revisit the market rate. I mean, we just saw... <laughs> an article come out about a $90,000 a year parking spot in San Francisco. If that's the kind of market rate we're talking about, again, we're not gonna solve our issues around housing. Um, we, we do definitely need to have affordable housing um, and we need to make sure that we're um, implementing a lot of the laws that are getting passed because for decades laws have been passed by the legislature and nothing's been done about it. And so I really want to work with our local elected leaders and community members to make sure that we're actually making those, delivering on those promises of building and making things affordable and making sure that our most vulnerable don't end up on the streets and our teachers, our firefighters, our nurses, all the people we called heroes during the pandemic don't have to worry about sleeping in their cars. Thank you. And Liz, you, you bring me to a question about mental health and thoughts around permanent supportive housing and the need for things that are being somewhat newly introduced, such as care courts. So I'm curious what your thoughts are there. Um, these mental health courts will bring a new approach to California. Um, and I'm curious how you plan to support East Bay communities in their effort to implement the care courts and the services that will be needed to surround them. And Liz, why don't you start us with that one? Yeah, I mean, I initially opposed uh, the care courts because, again, something that I don't hear very much is equitable and equity uh, in this campaign. And that's something that's a platform of mine. Uh, I've seen the court system. I know what happens to people of color, that people that look like me, they usually end up in the court system and they end up in prison. And not seeing the meat on what was being proposed uh, and the fears of what I've actually seen happen, I opposed this. Now it's passed, the governor signed it or is going to sign it. Uh, and so now it's about implementation. So my plan is to work um, with, again, our county leaders, which I have a lot of experience working with the Alameda Health System and making sure that we have you know, enough clinicians um, to make sure that we address a lot of the mental health issues that are happening in our community. For decades, we, we haven't invested enough in um, our therapists and our clinicians or even our mental health facilities. So making sure those resources are there, not just a one-time thing, but an ongoing budgetary item. Um, secondly, housing. 50% uh, of the people that are uh, currently homeless have mental health issues. So if we're going to put them in a tiny home or in a hotel for uh, you know, 72 hours or, or a week or a month, they're just going to end up back on the streets. We need wraparound services if we're going to talk about housing for mental health um, to help um, folks with mental health issues. Uh, and lastly, you know, working with our, our schools, we have a lot of youth who don't have access to mental health very early on. So again, making sure that the resources are made available um, at the very beginning um, when they're in school is another priority of mine. Thank you. Sean, would you like to talk a little bit about your thoughts on the CARE Courts proposal? Absolutely. As a, a early and staunch um, proponent uh, for the governor's proposal to create CARE Courts, you know, and, and just to be clear, you know, when, when my opponent was asked on an ACLU questionnaire whether or not she would oppose legislation to force unhoused individuals, she said yes. And that's exactly from the very get-go what care, this care court proposal aimed to do. So I'm glad to hear that she has come along and now supports the proposal. Uh, because when I am out talking to families who have family members that 
are suffering from uh, severe mental illness, schizophrenia, or they are suffering from substance use disorder and uh, substance use psychosis. You know, these individuals don't have a way to get their families the help that they need. And the sad part is that uh, this system that we have now is set up in a way that these individuals can only get care in a prison or jail. And that's simply unacceptable. And it was never proposed that care courts would be a criminal justice form of court. It was always proposed that it was going to be a, a system where, uh, you know, a care court judge, along with a team of social workers and clinicians, can put together a care plan for an individual. Now, let's be very clear, this is not a silver bullet. This is just the beginning of getting people into the care that they need. Uh, we're going to need to create uh, additional services. We're going to need to create additional housing for these individuals. And those two things are already in shortage for everyone who needs them, right? So we're going to need to invest uh, a lot. And it's going to be about um, cooperation. And I'm very proud to have worked side by side with Assemblymember Rebecca bauer Cahan uh, to pass AB 988. And uh, knock on wood, that's going to get signed here any day now by the governor. And it's going to create a steady stream of revenue funds for our uh, local jurisdictions to create mental health care response systems. What we have now is kind of a hodgepodge of different, you know, grant funded and publicly funded CBOs and, and different pro uh, pilot programs. And they're all doing great things. They're innovating to try to figure out what the best solution is. For example, in Dublin, we joined up with our Tri-Valley cities in the, on the Alameda County side of the, the border. Uh, to make sure that we had what's, you know, with uh, Access Community Health, to make sure we had a program called Access Bridge, which is a phone line where people can dial. Different communities across this uh, district are looking at different models for people to be able to call in and, and access services and, and, and get on the continuum of mental health care, you know, and for a lot of people, even people who have insurance, there's just not enough clinicians, there's just not enough capacity out there. Right, so as, at the state level, I will focus uh, a lot of my time and energy on figuring out ways to create additional capacity. In the military I'm, uh, and in my um, education, I'm an uh, instructional designer and trainer. So I've worked with adult education uh, and, and training programs to figure out how you give people the knowledge and skills and abilities so that they can succeed in their roles. And I wanna take that to bear in our education system and find ways to create pathways into 21st century jobs. Thank you both. We've got about 10 minutes left for questions and there are a few that were submitted. So I'm going to do my best to get to those. But before we jump into those, I did just wanna to quickly touch on energy and the environment. And Sean kind of concluded his remarks thinking about the workforce, which is an area in which, of course, energy and environment has a lot of crossover as we think about energy transition and changes to our state. But we also think about things like Prop 30, right? And how we're going to meet some of the goals that have been stated by the governor. I'm curious if both of you can talk a little bit about your thoughts on energy transition and, and our environment and how that fits into your platform. Uh, Sean, why don't you begin? Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, I, I support Proposition 30. Uh, you know, it's no, nothing is is perfect. You know, this is going to be put before the voters. It's uh, something that they will ultimately decide on. And you know, uh, when we generate revenue for programs uh, like is proposed in Prop Thirty, uh, it creates a steady stream of funds so that we can do important work in the long term. So what I like about it is is that it's going to move funds into creating EV infrastructure. I'm an EV driver. I also live in a multifamily home that's not equipped for uh, a level two charger. I don't have my own stall where I can install a charger. So I rely on EV infrastructure. And what we're seeing is, you know, I, I do this work as a uh, board member on East Bay Community Energy. What we're seeing is throughout the, the Bay Area and across California, we simply do not have enough infrastructure to transition to EVs. Now, you know, clean transportation does not just look like EVs. It also looks like hydrogen fuel cell cars. That's going to require infrastructure as well. It looks like clean and green uh, mass transit, like Valley Link. 
but we need to really think about uh, the, uh, the EV market because the governor has set a very bold goal that we will not be selling internal combustion engine vehicles by the year 2035. So that means the 2 million cars that get sold in California every year will be some form of EV or hydrogen fuel cell or who knows what kind of future technology we might have. Uh, but that's a lot of, those are a lot of EVs. And that means we're gonna need to have a network an infrastructure of chargers, fast chargers across the state and in every community, including the communities of most need. Those that are in older construction who don't have uh, the, the resources to install that infrastructure on their, on their own. Um, and also for you know those who are in uh, multifamily homes, right? So they they need to have access to this uh, you know form of transportation of the future as well. So I, I support Prop Thirty. Well, thank you, Sean. Liz, would you like to share your thoughts? Yeah, I mean Prop Thirty is not a fix all. Um, it's definitely a move in the right direction. I am concerned with you know companies like Uber and Lyft being the ones to tell us how those funds will be spent. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it, but I definitely think it's a step in the right direction in terms of, uh, equitable and access to some of these chargers. Uh, I'm glad to hear my opponent drives a electric vehicle. Unfortunately, many of the, the workers that actually make the vehicles, electric vehicles in um, this district cannot afford, um, those cars because they're very expensive. Um, so I'm hoping uh, from an equity lens, if we really want to make sure that, you know, we move towards eliminating gas vehicles, that we actually look at it from a perspective of those who are making the, uh, the cars but can't afford them. Um, it's not okay that they're driving, you know, <laughs> from Stockton and, um, you know, all these other areas hours on end to get to work, um, but they don't have access to saving the environment. And so if we really want to look at that, we should think about rebates for the under, underserved communities who currently don't have access. Um, secondly, yes, that infrastructure is huge. Um, if you drive around, you know, some of the unincorporated parts of the district and Hayward, uh, I don't even think I've seen any um, um, electric vehicle charging stations or very few. I could probably count them on one hand. Um, so that's going to be a big thing. Also, as we look at, you know, housing and building, making sure that we're looking at the new buildings, having, you know, some of the newer technology um, that, you know, can help um, get us to those climate goals that we're looking for. But the one thing that hasn't been talked about is actually enforcement of polluters. Unfortunately, we still have a large group of, again, corporations, and I'm talking about the 1% of corporations, not you know, our local businesses or small businesses. I'm talking about some of the largest um, corporations that actually made billions during the pandemic coming into some of our un underserved communities and trying to pollute them even more. Um, so I want to make sure that there is real enforcement that comes out of my office as your assembly member to ensure that we're not continuing to say we want clean air and say we want clean cars, uh, but only for a certain percentage of the community. If we're going to talk about um, meeting our, you know, environmental goals, we need to look at it from an equity lens uh, and look at those most disadvantaged that are large portion of Assembly District 20. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to end our question and answer with a question from the audience that I think is, is a good summarizing one. But I'm also going to ask you both try to keep your answer to about a minute because we are starting to run out of time. But this question says, candidates often say how they will go to Sacramento and make things better locally. Can you give a specific example of something you would like to do locally? And Liz, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I mean, I we talked a lot about uh, all the different issues. I think for housing, I would like to go up there and really tackle the housing uh, crisis. And, you know, and it would be silly for me to be on here and say that I'm going to do all this by myself. Nothing gets done in Sacramento by yourself. You're one out of 80. So being able to have those relationships built in, being able to get in there on day one and really talk um, tackle, again, not just building, but the affordability and talk about the rents and talk about our homelessness. Those are the issues that I want to 
get in on day one. And then I have the relationships to be able to do so. Um, I don't have a, you know, I don't need training wheels. I've built these relationships over 20 years. I've been in Sacramento in the middle of the night when corporations and other special interests are negotiating. And the people that are that get left behind are people that look like me. And I have a strong track record of getting in there fighting, but also getting things done and making sure that they have a local impact. Uh, one other example, hazard pay. You know, I pass hazard pay in five different cities here in Alameda County. Um, and it's something that I wanna look at in Sacramento because if we're, we're fooling of ourselves if we think that this pandemic is over and that we're not gonna need our heroes to be compensated in some way. Thank you, Liz. Sean? Well, I think all you have to do is take a look at uh, my record. And I think that is uh, the biggest difference between my opponent and I. I have a record of serving as an elected official and delivering results for Alameda County families. You know, you can actually go out there and see the housing that's being built right now that I helped to shepherd through. And it's not just going to in a meeting and, and hitting the yes button. You have to work. You have to work with multiple stakeholders, with the community, with builders, with unions, uh, with the local business uh, uh, you know, economy. And you need to think about how all of this interplays. That's why I have always taken uh, every meeting, whether or not I uh, agree with people or not on a given issue, you know, and make sure that people have access to the process. And that's how I'm gonna act as a legislator. And when I go there, I'm gonna to continue to do the work of delivering results for Alameda County families that I've been doing for, uh, uh, you know, on my time uh, with council and on my time with the district director. You know, and you can take a look at that record and, and you can see how I've delivered for folks uh, and make a decision about whether or not you think that's a, a good thing or not. Uh, but at least I have a record to evaluate and um, I'm pretty proud of that. Um, you know, so I'm going to continue to fight for, for housing. I'm going to continue to tackle the homelessness issue. I'm going to continue to tackle mental health in our, in our communities. And I'm going to continue to make sure that we work close hand in hand with law enforcement to ensure we have uh, safe communities here in the, in the 20th assembly district. Okay. Thank you both for being here. Uh, it's been great to get to engage with you, and I really appreciated hearing all of your answers and thoughts. Um, I am going to give you both the opportunity to provide some final thoughts and, and to, to provide some closing remarks as we conclude this. Um, and I will start with you, Sean, since we started with you in the beginning. Oh, thank you, Lindy. Uh, great job um, you know, uh, running this forum, and I really appreciate uh, all of the uh, business and industry groups that came together to hold this important conversation. Now, I'm 21 year veteran of the United States Navy, Dublin council member, district director, current assembly member. I come ready on day one to get results for East Bay families, just as I have as a council member, just as I have as a district director. And you all know me, I've worked as your partner and we have sat in many meetings to work through these issues, work through legislation to make sure that we are taking all sides, every perspective into consideration as we make very important policy decisions. That's what I commit to do, continue to do as a legislator. The difference couldn't be any more stark in this regard between my opponent and I. Uh, I have consistently met with both sides of every issue, despite what she says, I have met with every union who will have me. Um, and then I have met with bus the business side. I've met with the industry side. I've met with our local chambers and small businesses, and I've met with our community leaders. And that's what I will uh, continue to do as your next assembly member. Please visit seankumagai.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and please join the team. We have a lot of work to do over the next six weeks. Uh, we need every contribution. We need every volunteer. We need to get out and spread our word about how we're going to get results for East Bay families. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Liz, would you like to provide some closing remarks? Yes. Um, thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here. Again, my name is Liz Ortega. I'm currently the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Alameda Labor Council, and I'm running to represent Assembly District 20. I've lived here my entire life. I have fought hard and delivered results all over this county. 
That's why I'm honored to be endorsed by the outgoing assembly member, Bill Quirk. Assembly member Quirk carefully vetted all of the candidates, including my opponent. And when he announced his endorsement of me, he said that he was endorsing me because of my years of leadership and advocacy in Sacramento for the life-saving issues and importance to your family and mine. I've always met with all of our uh, you know, community members and will continue to do so. But like many folks who have endorsed me will say, we don't always agree. We don't always get along, but Liz Ortega will make things happen. And that is what I expect to do on day one. I will not need training wheels when I get to Sacramento. I will get right to work with all the folks who have endorsement endorsed me, including, and I'm very excited to say this, our new sheriff elect Yesenia Sanchez. Because while public safety is also a priority for my community, and I want to make sure that I fight to ensure that everyone is safe, I under also personally understand that people who look like me and my family don't always get the same treatment as those that don't look like me uh, when it comes to law enforcement. And she recognizes this as well, which is why we're working together to make sure that we keep our community safe, but that we also look about other ways to think about public safety. So please join me and supporting Liz Ortega for assembly. We're gonna have a huge kickoff this Saturday in Hayward and excited to have all of you guys come by and talk to me. Okay, well, thank you both for being here. Again, it's been a pleasure to hear from you both and we wish you the best over the next six weeks. It's no easy thing to run for elected office. Uh, I did also wanna just once again, thank our fellow host organizations, East Bay EDA, the Barrier Council and the Innovation Tri-Valley Leadership Group. We are very grateful to work in such collaborative ways with these organizations and to support uh, the employers in our local region and all of the small businesses and large businesses that help to make our region thrive. So thank you all so much. Really been a pleasure to have you. And thank you to our attendees. Thank you all for being here.